The title of today's message, as you all have already read from your bulletin, is Easter. Easter. So let us pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus on this Easter Sunday. And we give you all the honor and all the glory. We thank you already for your presence here. And we thank you for your blessed little boy. We also thank you for all of our children. Father, we come before you just to thank you for taking over the service already. Let it be your will be done. Just let your will be done today in everybody's life. And all of God's people say, Amen. Glory be to God. You may be seated. And when you're seated, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 12. Oh, my Lord, my little is full of life. The Lord, you better bless me with the repair. The book of Acts, chapter 12. When you're there, say amen. Amen. Okay? Now, let's read verses 1 through 4. Now, about the time that Herod stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, uh, the brother of John, with the sword. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further take Peter, so, uh, uh, take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now I want to share something with you that's kind of interesting. The word Easter only appears once in the entire word of God and this is it. You cannot find it anywhere else in the Bible. It's the only place where it is. And in order for truly us, uh, let me rewind the tape. In order for us to truly understand Easter, okay, you must understand what it means, and therefore we're going to go through its meaning. Easter in the Greek is the word Pasha. In the Hebrew is Peshach. Okay, which literally means the Passover. It means the Passover. But within the confines of the Passover, you have the day, you have the sacrifice, <laughs> and you have the meal. The day, the sacrifice, and the meal. And I'm going to tie all this at the end. When you get a chance, read all of Exodus 12. I'm going to paraphrase a lot of it here, but read all of chapter 12, and you really understand the Passover. Okay? Now, the lamb that was going to be sacrificed had to be a lamb of the first year. It was under one year of age. Okay? Now, you had to bring that one little lamb into your home on the 10th day of the first month. On the, now, we're using the Hebrew calendar here, so, so it's the 10th day of the first month. And you would nurture this little lamb and feed it and care for it and do everything you needed to do for it for four days. And on the 14th day of the first month, it would be sacrificed. Now, I find it interesting here that the Lord actually had them keep it for four days, just enough time to get attached to it before they killed it. Just enough to get attached to it before they killed it. You know why? Because they, God wanted them to experience exactly what he was going to experience when he had to sacrifice his life. See, most people think that, oh, it's God and Jesus. No, 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 no. You have no idea what it costs God to get us into the kingdom. Especially when he sacrificed the Lamb of God, his only begotten son. Oh, come on now, church. Praise the Lord. Yes, I agree with you, my brother. I'm glad somebody's getting it. Praise the Lord. Now, for this Passover, remember that they were in bondage in Egypt. And God was about to deliver them, but the final plague was coming, and it was the plague of death upon Egypt. It had already been declared. In order for them to avoid this, once they sacrificed this yearling and began roasting it with fire, they took the blood and they literally put it on the T-post of the door. 
okay, the T post of the door. Now, believe it or not, Jesus was crucified on a T post. Not a cross like this. Like we say, but it doesn't mean really, I don't I couldn't care less than he wanted to take a cross. Take the cross. The fact that he hung on a tree is what matters. Okay? But he they would put the blood on the T post and all in front of the door. Now, when the angel of death came through Egypt, he went to every house, and the house that did not have the blood on the door, the firstborn in that house died. And all the all the firstborn of all the animals died. There was a major death in Egypt, including the son of Pharaoh. And this was literally the Passover. The blood is significant of the blood that will be later shed. The teeth post is where Jesus was going to hang. Okay? Now, let me just go over the view briefly right here. The day is the day of redemption. The sacrifice was the lamb or Jesus Christ and the meal was holy. The meal was holy. Now within the confines of the meal, they also had unleavened bread and bitter herbs, which we're going to get to. Now, the unleavened bread simply represents bread that has no yeast in it. Because yeast in the Bible represents sin. And it's a holy meal. It's a holy meal. The bitter herbs were consumed to give them a reminder of the 400 years of slavery they had spent. It was a bitter reminder of the 400 years of slavery they had spent in Egypt. Now let me just share something with you. We should consume bitter herbs as a little reminder of how lost we were before we got saved. Because we were in slavery to the enemy. We were enslaved to the enemy. Come on now. Let's get it together here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So on the 14th day, the lamb is sacrificed, the meal is in, the blood was put on the post, and the angel of death passed over the house. And this was supposed to be a holiday that was supposed to be remembered for all their generations, and it is still celebrated to this day. Now, I'm going to, yes, celebrate it to this day. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Now, notice that it was a lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. They had no eggs. They had no bunny rabbits. They had no chocolate. They didn't have any of that. They were not celebrating what we have come to term Easter, which is tied into the equinox and the new moon and all kinds of other mumbo jumbo garbage, which I'm not really going to get into. But the bottom line is, is that Easter is a celebration of sex. Because the goddess that it represents is the goddess of estrus, which is a goddess of fertility and sex. Now, what's the biggest problem we have in the church today? We have, oh, in the world today, we have all kinds of 12, 13, 14, and 15-year-olds bearing children. Why? Because we have exposed them for 15 years to Easter. And when you put, if, if you constantly expose your children to spirits that are demonic, whose sole purpose is to take them over and reproduce as soon as they can, they will. Exactly. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to protect our children from these demonic Easter egg hunts. You can, you don't think there's anything wrong with it? You're exposing your children to demonic forces. Come on now, church. Keep your children guarded from the evil. Amen. Glory be to God. Show me anywhere in the Bible where you find an egg on Easter. In the Word. Passover. Not a one. You didn't see them having chocolate for dessert. And the chocolate is the enticer to get the kids to come. To be demonically exposed. That's all I'm going to say on that. I'm over with that. I got over it. Pray the Lord. Glory be to God. Got over it real quick. Woo, glory. Now, I'm going to read Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 12. Just listen. 
He is despised and rejected. We're talking about Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief, carried our sorrow. We Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And we like the sheep have gone astray. We turned uh, uh, everyone uh, onto his own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to slaughter, as a sheep before the shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living. For the transgressors of my people he was stricken. He was made, he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in death, because he had none, no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief, and thou shalt make his soul an offering of sin. He shall, his, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper his hand. He shall see of the tra uh, travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall be righteous servants justified many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he has and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the actual life of Jesus Christ in a nutshell from birth to the cross. That's his life from birth to the cross. Everything that we are, he took upon himself with respect to our sinful nature and he replaced it with himself so that we could become the children of God. Yeah, see, but we don't want we don't want to talk about this. Why? Because we rather you know, we like sin. Sin is fun. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> see, the reason why most people don't want to come to God is because they believe that what they have in the world is better than God. Because that's all they know. Sin is fun. But let me tell you something. Sin will take you further than you're willing to go and it will cost you more than you're willing to pay. When it's all said and done, do you want to spend eternity in hell? That's where sin will take you. Eventually, that's where you will be. Glory be to God. But thanks to God that He sent the Lamb of God. He sent His only begotten Son. He sent the living Word of God. He sent them so that one day He would go up on a cross named Calvary. And when it was all said and done, we would be redeemed. Woo! I hope I'm not the only one getting excited here today. But you know, I can't help myself. It just happens. Glory be to God. Turn to the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 22. Ha, he's celebrating already. We haven't got to the beach yet. <laughs> See that? Even, even, listen, even the spirit of a child rejoices before the Lord in his presence. Yes. Right. Yes. Am I the only one seeing this? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, verses 14 through 22. 22 verses 14 through 22 and when the hour was come he sat down with the 12 apostles and with him and he said with desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer see Jesus knew he was going to suffer for I say unto you I will not eat I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God and he took the cup and he gave thanks and said take this divide it among yourselves for this I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until 
the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave them and saying, This is my body which is given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after the supper saying, This cup is the New Testament and my blood which is shed for you. Um, behold, uh, which is shed for you. And it says, Behold the hand of him that is red he is with me at the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it is determined, but woe unto the man by whom he is betrayed. Oh, glory be to God. Glory be to God. I want you to notice something. This would be the last supper that Jesus would ever have before he died. And isn't it amazing how anyone on death row gets a final meal? Which did they got it from? Right here. But notice that he also established communion. He also established communion at the Last Supper. And that's why we're having communion today because it's the Passover feast. Okay? Now, Judas was also with him who should betray him. How many of you that sometimes you may be in a situation where the person that's with you will betray you? It's a life example that we sometimes need to take heed to. Right? Pray for one. No matter where you are or who you are, life is going to have trials and tribulations, but Jesus has overcome them all. Turn to the Gospel of Mark as we continue with our Passover. Chapter 14. And we're going to go from verse 60 to 64. Verse 60 to 64. When you're there, say amen. amen. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing like a lamb? Jesus didn't say a word. What, what is this which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we of any further witness? We have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Now I want you to understand something. This is the first time in the church where a man has come and spoken the truth and was convicted. He spoke the truth. He was the Son of God. And here's the sad part about it. They read the Torah. Every male in Israel before he's 13 has to memorize it. The Torah speaks of him. All the signs and shadows of it are of him. And yet they couldn't recognize him when he was here. Let me tell you something. The church is in such sad shape now that if Jesus showed up again, we'd throw him out. Excuse me, sir. Take your doctrine. And leave. That's exactly what we would do. Because the church wouldn't even recognize him when he showed up. But they will see him when he comes back in school. Ready to get his bride. Ready to pick up his bride. Now, I'm going to paraphrase Luke 23. I want you to understand something. He's just been convicted. Okay? Now, Luke 23, you can read it later. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Okay, so they took Jesus to Pilate. And Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with it. His wife told him, don't have anything to do with this man. I had a dream. So Pilate said, okay, where's he from? Ah, he's from heaven's jurisdiction. He sent them over to heaven. Okay? Now, Herod wanted to meet the man because he wanted to see some miracles. And then Herod actually just brushed him off and sent him back to Pilate. Okay. Now, here's something that's interesting. Herod and Pilate hated each other. But they hated Christ more and they became friends because of their hate for Christ. <laughs> Go figure. Pilate and Herod were not friends. But after they both had the same problem with Christ, they became friends. 
Another thing, another way of looking at it is when you're in the presence of Almighty God, you can't help but to love your enemy. I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> now, both Herod and Pilate found Jesus not guilty. The church had already condemned him, even though there was no evidence to what they claimed. Pilate and Herod, two non-church men, men of Rome in position of leadership, could see the innocence in the man, but the church couldn't. What a messed up church we have. And this was back then. No, it's true today. The church isn't any better now than it was 2,000 years ago. Oh, I don't know why I have to say that again. Thank you, Lord. So Jesus is found not guilty, yet the church wants him crucified, and they chose a man named Barabbas, who was an actual insurrector against Rome, over Christ. And Pilate gave them leave to crucify him. Pilate gave them leave to, but it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't just a crucifixion. Jesus took a beating that would kill any average man. He took a beating like you wouldn't believe. They punched him in the face. They slapped him in the face. They put a crown of thorns on his head and then beat him with a two by four. Could you imagine putting, having putting a crown of thorns with the thorns about three inches long and then I rack you in the head with a two by four? Come on now. By the time they got through with him, he was unrecognizable. They put him, they tied him up and they beat him 39 times with a cat of nine tails that completely destroyed his back. And yet the word says that by his stripes we are healed. I want you to understand something. There isn't anything that Christ went through that doesn't have an eternal purpose. There isn't anything that Christ went through that doesn't have an eternal purpose. And this is why remembering him at Passover is so critical for the church. And understanding why Passover is important is even more important. Because he is the reason for the Passover. Oh, come on now. Somebody get excited with me. Oh, glory to God. Jesus carried the cross and he was crucified. Now, get this. He was crucified by both the Jews and the Romans. He was crucified by both the Jews and the Romans. Why? Because there was only one lamb. And if the Jews took it, we'd be left out. If we took it, they'd be left out. So we commit the crime together, so we're included. That's insane. But that was the plan. Remember that it was a Roman who pierced his side finally at the end. And it was the Romans who made sure that he got there. And they made sure that he was crucified and whoop, they brought him up. Okay? Now, I want us to uh, go to Luke 23 again. I want to show you something that's really, really, really neat. Really, really neat. Verses 33 and 34 of chapter 23. And when they were come to a place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him with, with, and the malefactors, one on the left and one on the right hand. And Jesus said, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My Lord and my God. What an awesome statement. Here is a man that has been utterly destroyed by his fellow man. And on the cross, the love he has in his heart for them is greater than everything they've done to him. And he looks upon them with the eyes of love and then he asks the Father, who is the Father of love, to forgive them for they do not what they did. My Lord and my God. If you comprehend what this is, it's it's beyond 
mind boggling. Now, I want to turn to Matthew 27, 33. You don't have to turn. I just want to read one, one scripture just to show you something. Matthew 27, 33. I just want to read a quick verse. You have to turn there. Okay. And it says, And when they came into a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. Now I want to go dancing with this verse. Okay. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Remember, Golgotha is a place of a skull. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Verses 14 and 15. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle and every beast of the field, and upon the, thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise thy heel. Let me tell you what how, how beautiful God is in making sure that everything comes to pass exactly as he said. How many of you have read, read the story of David and Goliath? How many of you know that David killed Goliath? How many of you know that David decapitated Goliath? And he took his head with him. You know where he buried it? Right outside of Israel in a little hill called Golgotha, the place of a, of a skull. He buried it in the place which is now known as Golgotha, the place of a skull. He's so excited about Golgotha, he just like, I'm telling you, praise, glory be to God. He buried the skull just outside of Jerusalem in the place which became known as Golgotha. Now let's just read this carefully one more time. Um, verse 14. And the Lord said unto the uh, serpent, oh no, verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Do you realize that this is symbolic for Jesus Christ having victory over the serpent as his foot would stop on its head? Now, in order to have that symbolism go, the skull was already buried many years before by David where the cross was resurrected and his head was directly over the skull. Oh, hoo -hoo! Come on now. This was fulfilled beautifully by God himself. He made sure that the heels of Jesus Christ were over Goliath, who was nothing more than a representative of the devil himself. Oh, come on now. Am I the only one getting excited here about what God is doing? Hallelujah. Blessed be his holy name. This isn't just a Passover. When you come to my house and leave in two hours, that you just passed over. <laughs> this is an eternal Passover. This is a Passover that would affect mankind through the history of mankind until Christ returns and establishes his kingdom to which there is no end. Oh, come on, church. Am I the only one getting excited about what God is doing? Now listen, this is how it goes. His seed, the baby, is Jesus. The woman is Mary. Woo -hoo -hoo! And that's where we are. And they were separated. And Jesus' heel was directly on. See, most people don't understand that God has a purpose for everything. Who would have ever thought that little David would take this head, put on his donkey, and go off riding on it? Then he gets to that little bit. I'll bury it here. Bingo! The exact same place where Jesus would be crucified. The exact same place. Glory be to God. Okay? Let's get ready to close it out because we do have other things to do. Let's go to John 19.30. Okay? In my professional opinion and my gospel opinion, these are the most beautiful words ever spoken by Christ on the cross. Okay? John 19, 
verse number 30. And when Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. I can spend two hours on just those three words. It is finished. It is finished. Okay? Now, go to Matthew 28, let's read verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to get ready to have some fun. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 6. If you're there, say amen. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and many other uh, came to the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and then rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his remnant white as snow. And uh, for fear of him, the reapers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that thou seekest Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. He is risen. And he said, Come and see the place where he, where the Lord lay. Now, let's go and put these two together and make it all like it's supposed to be. Jesus came as the Lamb of God who was innocently convicted and crucified. And he forgave all and died. And then he went ahead and rose from the dead. You see, the Passover is from death unto life. When we really take a look at the original Passover, the angel of death passed everyone by so that no one died in the house. When Jesus was risen, he passed all of us from death unto life so we don't have to have the second death come upon us. See, he reconciled man back unto God. He reconciled God back unto the heavens. He established the new and everlasting covenant by which we live through today. Woo -hoo! Can I hear an amen from somebody? Amen. At the cross, at the cross he defeated all that could possibly go against us. It was the greatest moment in victory for all mankind, yet it was his greatest moment of defeat so that we could triumph wait for him to come and pick us up at the bride and take us home to be with him forever and ever in the new and everlasting kingdom through the millennial reign and then for eternity glory be to God that he came and passed over oh. he may have come as the lion of the tribe of Judah and then was sacrificed as the lamb of God but he shall return as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we will see him as he is. Amen. Not that beat up thing they had on the cross. You know what the only thing that Jesus and I have in common we're both looking? <laughs> Why do you laugh? Was I not created in his image? If he's good looking, I'm good looking, you're good looking. You're pretty. <laughs> See, because the woman was taking out a man, so she's not good looking. She's pretty. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you getting the logistics of this Passover? What Easter is truly all about. It has nothing to do with anything else but Jesus Christ and the cross. The entire Bible is about Jesus Christ and the cross. When you look at it, Genesis to Malachi, Jesus is coming to be crucified. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is here and he was crucified. He died and he was resurrected. Acts to Revelation, he ascended up to the Father, but he is coming back with the church. That's the whole Bible in a nutshell. And that's what Passover is all about. Jesus coming, crucified, defeating death and the grave. Hell couldn't hold him. The devil couldn't hold him. Nothing could hold him. He went down to hell, took the sins upon the world, dropped them off to Satan. Man had the keys that he took from Adam. Thank you very much. And he just walked right out. And to this day, we have the authority of the name of Jesus that we can use at our disposal. 
because of the old rugged cross. We're actually going to say the student's prayer. The whole church is going to say it with them. But the people that are getting baptized. Make yourself alive. Don't worry, we're not going to dunk you. Oh, you want it bad. Okay. Everyone who's getting baptized, pray for the Lord. Now, we're all going to say the sinner's prayer to make sure we're right with God. Then we're all going to partake of communion. Then we're going to get baptized. Amen? Amen. On a Passover holiday. This could not be more appropriate. Glory be to God. Okay, let's all just repeat that thing. Close your eyes and just repeat that thing. Jesus, I come to you. Jesus, Jesus I come to you. Just as I am. Just as I am. I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. And I believe in my heart. And I believe in my heart. That you are the Son of God. That you are the Son of God. Who came and died for me. Who came and died for me. And you were resurrected on the third day. You were resurrected on the third day. And now you sit. Now at the right hand of power. Jesus, I ask you now to come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. And I thank you that I am washed. I am cleansed. I am saved. Thank you, Lord, that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And from this day forward, and this day for I'll live my life for you. I'll live Amen. my life for you. Amen. Glory be to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, our brother Cisco, would you get the elements ready, please? No, don't stay right there.